Casual Shooters podcast, your premier podcast for the casual shooter. This will be my first ever opinion piece, much like an editorial in a newspaper. I've used the USPSA meeting minutes to try to help add some clarity to what I'm about to say. Depending on how this is received, eh, maybe I'll do more, but it could fall on its face and I'm, <laughs> I won't do it again. But anyway, here it goes. Keep in mind, this is my opinion. First off, I want to thank Mank, that's Matt and Frank, of the Bullets and Bourbon podcast, for hosting Russell Fortney, the Area 8 director of the USPSA on their podcast. As far as I'm aware, this is his first ever public appearance. Now let me define that. By public, I mean more than just at a match. That episode being public Folks around the world can actually listen in and hear what Russell has to say, not just him being at a match. I think a lot can be gleaned from what he said. With that, I must also thank Russell Fortney for going on the show and answering the questions that were posed. For the record, I invited Russell onto the podcast here, the Casual Shooters podcast, to talk about why he was running for Area 8 prior to him being elected. He initially said yes, but then never came on. Every other candidate for the last two years since I've been doing this has come on the show to talk about their candidacy for an area director spot or presidency. So the only exception to that was Matt Hopkins recently when he was running for Area 6. He deferred until uh, determining who was going to be in the runoff election. If he was going to be in the runoff election, then he said he would come on but he was going to hold off until then. Now, I was told privately that Russell thought I didn't like him. So I sent him a DM on social media explaining that I did not dislike him. As a matter of fact, I didn't know him well enough to dislike him. Um, and, you know, I explained that I did not and, and whatnot, and he responded, and, and that's where we left it. To this day, I do not dislike Russell. Again, I don't really know him personally. However, I could not vote for someone that would not make their stances public when running for any kind of election. You know, he's going to be representing thousands of people in Area 8. So I felt that in order to do that you, you, properly, you need to come on and let people know what you're doing. Well, that's he, he chose the... Biden basement election campaign. So that's what he did. And he basically turned it into a popularity vote. Now he travels a lot for matches. So most people know him and he runs good matches and he's very personable. You get out there, you meet him again. I've had no, no poor interactions. They've always been cordial, you know, shaking each other's hands and stuff. So he's not a bad guy. His opponent was more local and did not have the fan base that Russell did. That being said, I think he still had a better resume for being on the board of director then, and I still think that now. As I go along, I'll use what he said and, and how he has voted as part of my rebuttal. So let's go all the way. Now, this rebuttal is from him being on the Bullets and Bourbon podcast. You can go and look it up. And some of the things that were said, uh, I'm going to hit on it more at the end, but the first thing I want to do is I want to start when Russell got into office. They brought him into office early, July 25th, 2023. Russell attended his first board of directors meeting as the Area 8 director. His first vote was a yes for the massive uh, increase in membership fees. Do I think they needed to be increased? I do. I, I agree with raising the membership fees. Do I think they should have made as big a jump as they did? Absolutely not. This should have been an, inter, an incremental hike. Not something that's you going from zero to 100 in, you know, what was it, two months. Um, it needed to be, let's do... A, an increase this year. Let's do an increase next year. Let's do an increase the year after that. Determine where you want to be at the end of three to five years and make those incremental jumps so that you're not hammering people from day one. 
but he did. He voted yes. Um, and then what happened? There's all kinds of outcry. Eight days later at a special meeting, they unanimously passed a motion to postpone those increases until October 1. They still did them. They just gave people time to renew so that they wouldn't be significantly affected. He also seconded the motion to change the financial advisors to Carnegie Investment Council, which did pass unanimously. I believe that was um, a Scott Arnberg suggestion. Now, we go to the August meeting. August 28, 2023. Area 8 made a presentation regarding bylaws 6.17 and 6.26. Those have to do with the requirement to be an RO to hold office. He proposed dropping that specific requirement for area directors and the, pre, uh, and the president. And I agree with that. So that was the proposal. There was no vote on it at that meeting. That was just a proposal. They had to wait till the next month. Also at that meeting, the addition of the Rifle World Shoot and PCC World Shoot was added to the scope of the World Shoot Committee. Now, Rifle World Shoot is this year, 2024. There have been no public announcements as to who will be attending as Team USA and no idea on how they were selected. And it's now February of 2024. As a matter of fact, today is exactly February 23rd. So there are six days left in the month. This is a leap year. Now, let's go to September. September 18, 2023, Russell voted yes to change the bylaws and remove the requirement of RO. However, the motion failed to pass due to it needing a supermajority, and you had Layton, Mel, and Bruce Wells of Area 6 who all voted no. So that was one vote too many. So it did not pass. And I congratulate Russell on that vote. I'm, I don't want to say congratulate. It's not the right word. But uh, I commend him on that because I agree with him. That That is probably something that needs to be removed. Go back, look at it, figure something else out. And if something needs to be added later, so be it. Now, at 2158 on that same September day, 18th of 2023, Layton made a motion to enter executive session for the Finance Committee report. Now, why do you have to go into executive session for a finance report is beyond me. Members have the right to know what the Finance Committee chair has to say, which would be Scott Arnberg. At 2020, I'm sorry, at 2236, they exited executive session. Had to pause for a moment and take a drink of coffee. <clears throat> So they were in executive session for about 38 minutes. When they came out, Scott Arnberg made a motion to remove Ted at Murphy as president for lack of doing what the board had already voted on to do as it pertained to some financial moves. The board had already approved it, and Ted was refusing to do it, as I understand it. Now, Frank seconded the motion. Layton called this out of order because it was not on the agenda. Uh, I'm assuming at this point, things started to get heated. Russell motions to go back into executive session. And Bruce Six, Bruce Wells of Area Six, I'll just call him Bruce Six from here on out, seconds that motion at 2306. So now it's about 30 minutes being out of executive session, they're back into executive session, and they're in there for 15 minutes. At, they come out at 23.21. At 23.33, so 12 minutes later, Bruce Six motions to remove Scott from the Finance Committee, and Layton seconds it. The vote was 4-3, to three and Scott was removed. I actually applaud Russell here for voting no to removing Scott from the Finance Committee. I 100% agree with that vote. As I see it, he did the right thing. However, how was this not considered out of order? If you're voting no to remove Scott, then why can't you call the vote out of order? 
it was not on the agenda. That's why Leighton called Scott's motion out of order. And there was no motion to add it to the agenda, at least it's not in the minutes. So again, how was this not out of order? This is the type of hypocrisy that folks have been watching over the last several years. As far as I can tell and from what I know, this was personal and I consider it to be an abuse of power. And that's why I think, personally, Leighton has reached the end of his road. I think it's... Uh, Leighton and I have spoken on the phone. And again, we had... It was a long conversation. I want to say it was an hour and a half. So, And it was a good conversation. And it was very professional on both ends. Nobody got heated. Nobody... We talked about a lot of different things. But at this point now... It appears as though people's emotions cannot be kept out of decision-making. That should have never happened. Personally, I think Russell should have said, wait a minute, that's out of order. You can't have one being out of order and not the other. So that 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 is an issue. I do consider that to be an abuse of power and a personal attack on Scott from Layton. Now, we move to October. October 23rd, 2023, a motion was made by Bruce Six to add polygraph testing to the agenda at 2338. So they've been in this meeting now for, it looks like about four and a half hours. I think it starts 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And now it's 1138 Eastern Standard Time. Mel seconded the motion. The vote was seven to one with Scott abstaining. As the Area 3 director, Frank Rizzi, the Area 7 director, was the only no. Russell voted yes. Now, on this, I disagree with him. They're not admissible in court for a reason. Some people do use them. They're used for pre-screening, but they should never be used on an employee like this. And I know he's not, quote-unquote, an employee, but, I mean, now we're, we're just getting technical. Secondly, the cost, which we now know was approximately $5,100, so $5,100, with some members not even having taken one, is ridiculous. We're going to spend five grand on some polygraph tests because somebody's panties are in a wad that somebody's been leaking some information. And to this day... I don't know what harm has actually been done, or was it just the fact that somebody broke a rule that you could punish them over? Thirdly, I think it's juvenile and retaliatory. There you go. I threw it out there. Bruce and Layton had an axe to grind, plain and simple. Um, that's how I see it. Bruce Six and Layton. Not, not Bruce Gary, Bruce Six, so Bruce Wells. And this was their way of going after somebody. And from a lot of people's perspectives, they wanted Scott off the board. And I've got more stuff about that coming up, so I'm not going to dive deep into that at the moment. At 23.44, so six minutes later, Bruce made a motion to require all board members to take a polygraph prior to January 1st due to the leaked confidential board information. And I'm going to get into what's confidential and what isn't later, and we'll have a longer discussion about it. It was seconded by Mel. There you go again. The vote was 6-2 to 1, meaning uh, 6 votes yes, 2 votes no, 1 abstention. Area 3 was a no, Area 7 was a no, and the president abstained. I'm not sure why he abstained. That doesn't make any sense to me. This ultimately leads to the vote in December to remove Scott and really propels the protests forward. The, once we hit December, it's it's all go, especially Area 3. So the board can't sit there, and Russell can't sit there and say, I don't really know what the protest is about. Come on, that is disingenuous. November 27, 2023. Once again, it looks as though the board went into executive session for the Finance Committee report. Why? Now, Russell, I believe at this time, was the head of the finance committee. He replaced Scott. 
But apparently the membership is not allowed to know what is recommended by the finance committee. They want to keep all the particulars private. Nothing says they went into executive session in the, the meeting minutes, which is really weird. But Ben Barry was kicked out before that report and then allowed back in afterwards. So if they weren't in executive session, then why was Ben kicked out of the call and then allowed back in after? Hmm, I'm pretty sure they went into executive session. Now, both Area 3 and Area 7 voted no, allowing Donna to be an officer of the corporation. And I'm sure, once again, that ruffled some feathers. Here you go, just causing us more problems. At 2020, I'm sorry, at 2325, Scott made a motion to freeze salaries for two years starting November 1, 2023. No new positions shall be created or filled, and no new bonuses shall be distributed. Now, you have to remember the organization has been hemorrhaging cash. They've been going in the red every year now for a couple of years. So Scott had already made some suggestions back in, was it like June, July timeframe, and it was voted on to, to help them reduce the amount of fees that they have to pay annually, try to help earn more money and interest, things like that. So he'd already tried making some improvements to help the organization. Now here's another one. The org's hemorrhaging money. Let's freeze everything until we can get a, a handle on it all. Frank seconds the motion. It fails by a vote of 7-2. to two. You guessed it. Scott and Frank were the only two. Now here we go again. They motioned for something that the rest of them did not like and did not agree with. And they voted no for Donna being an officer of the corporation. They have both voted to remove Ted as president. So they are on the wrong side of history at the moment. Frank had an agenda item that was tabled due to the meeting time already being you know, uh, 1130 Eastern Standard Time. So I, I get that. But that item was releasing area directors and the president's annual expense reports. We'll come back to that later because it does uh, eventually come to vote. All right, December 18, 2023, otherwise known as we call D-Day. At 1910, President-elect Yi Min Lin and Area 6 Direct-elect Ben Barry were put in the Zoom waiting room while John Scouton gave a presentation. That is baffling. They were both 13 days and 5 hours from taking office. You had Area 6, who is Bruce Wells, who is gone in 13 days and 5 hours. Bruce Gary had already resigned. So you have two brand new coming on members in 13 days and they weren't allowed to sit in a presentation given by John Scouton of Shooting USA. I don't understand. what What is the deal there? I mean, is something going to come up in January, February, March, April, May, June that needs to be voted on? And you have Yi Min Lin and Ben Barry who can't be present in that presentation and what is so secret about the presentation that it's an executive session i mean look there could be stuff in there there could be financial numbers that you know they that they want to keep private okay in that case i'm i won't argue the point but that's not an answer for ben and Yi Min not being in the meeting they should have been in the meeting at 2319 Four hours later, Scott Arnberg was removed from the board as Area 7 director for allegedly forwarding a confidential email to which the minutes say he admitted to. I say allegedly because they did a um, forensic audit and they said with a 99.8% uh, chance 
he forwarded an email and then he admitted to it. I'll still use the word allegedly, but in the note meeting minutes, it does say he admitted to it. So what I would like to know is the definition of confidential. The organization doesn't have trade secrets. I mean, everything you want to know about them other than the finances is available on their website, their rules, all of that, their bylaws. If you're a member, you, you have access to all of that. So what, I mean, was it negotiated contracts? Uh, what, what was it that was shared? Was it an email regarding Troy and his punishment or lack thereof for his actions at nationals? Um, or what, I mean, was it just an email that said confidential to see if it would be forwarded? There aren't too many topics I would consider confidential. Now, here's what the bylaws state. So let's cover that real quick. I've got four bullet points that basically cover all the confidentiality uh, for the board. Financial information, employee information, membership lists, and similar matters. I don't like similar matters. That's a very, that's broad. It's gray. What the hell does that even mean? All open boardroom discussions shall remain confidential until the meaning, I'm sorry, until the minutes are approved for dissemination and unless otherwise approved by three quarters majority of the board. Okay. So you're not allowed to talk about meeting minutes until they're approved and disseminated to the public. We'll get into that in a minute because I've got more that of some stuff that goes back to that and latent executive sessions shall remain confidential. Now, however, as a side note from me, this is not the bylaws. This is me. They seem to use executive session to cover anything they don't want the membership to know about. I could be wrong, but that is most definitely the perspective I have. Do I think that's nefarious? Not necessarily, but I do think it's abused. I think they go into executive session way too often for way too many things. Again, the John Scouten thing, maybe there was something in there. Maybe not. Uh, you know, I can't say, but there's nothing, there's nothing I could think of in a John Scouten presentation that would exclude ye men and Ben. The fourth bullet I have is no officer or director. Remember, Don is now an officer shall supply copies or disseminate such confidential information to any third party without written consent or by resolution of the board of directors, except as otherwise provided in the bylaws. And there's a whole list of people you can share it with and, and how they would help the board or the board, the director or whomever, the organization. But really it's those three things, the financial information, the boardroom discussions and executive sessions. So now, I think there are some things that are black and white. Employee discipline should always be an absolute 100% no-no. Now, if that's what Scott admitted to sharing and it wasn't to a quote-unquote professional that's allowed to be shared with, then he was wrong, okay? Uh, that, that should not be done. There are certain things that should be kept private, and I think when you're dealing with individuals, those things need to be kept private. There are folks that have said, and uh, it wasn't me, so I'm just repeating what I have seen, and I am admitting to that right now, so you know, I, as for clarity, uh, but that Leighton has spoken about board meeting topics in Area 2 before the meeting minutes have been disseminated to the rest of the members. So technically, guess what? He broke confidentiality rules, if it's true. Therefore, based on what he did to Scott, he should be removed from office, like today, for what he did. Because there's also no um, time limit here, no statute of limitations that I saw in the bylaws. So if he's a board member, 
and let's say he's been a board member for 15 years. And back in 2013, in July, he spoke with Joe Snuffy at the Area 2, at an Area 2 match and divulged some information before the meeting minutes came out, then he could be removed from office. Do I think that should happen? No. But using his own methods, he could and should be removed, whether he likes it or not. That's how the rules work. They work for everybody, not just against the people you don't like or the methods that they use that you do not like. End of discussion. There is absolutely no discussion on that. That will get me fired up. However, I also think he uses his position for personal benefit at times. Uh, you know what I mean? So, I don't know. I could be wrong there too. It's just mm, something that... Anyway, we'll move on. I would, however, note the hypocrisy of his actions, for sure. And I would say that in a board meeting. If I were Russell, and he calls one motion out of order because it's not on the agenda, and then he turns around and does the same thing, I'd have been like, uh-uh, ain't happening, buddy. It's out of order. Next. The bottom line is, now going back to what, what occurred with Scott, what was the severity of the infraction? Okay. Was it a quote unquote similar matter? Was it something just that just said, do not share with outside people? Because that doesn't qualify as confidential. Sorry, like it or not, that's not how it qualifies. Um, or was he intentionally trying to harm the organization? You have to look at this from a standpoint of intent. What is the intent? And seriously, I don't think Scott ever had the intention of doing anything to harm the organization. Contrary, he's trying to help and preserve the organization. Hence, the financial um, motions that he made to help the organization. Ted didn't want to enact those that were voted on by the board. Again, as I understand it. So therefore, he voted to remove Ted so that somebody else could go in his place and do what the board had voted on. But apparently that's a big no-no. Maybe what they need to do is add some censorship to the bylaws, like Congress. The board can censor a member for a period of time with a supermajority vote. doesn't remove a board member, therefore you're not canceling the votes of the members in that area and removing the person they voted to represent them, but you could still punish them for a certain amount of time regardless. Uh, you could still punish them by removing access from sensitive material for a period of time. I, th I think that's probably something that needs to be looked at, especially with the questions of whether board members can even be removed. But there may be situations where, and I'm not saying it's with Scott, and I'm not saying it isn't, because I don't know exactly. But there may be situations where a censorship would be better. And you just kind of remove them from a certain area at a certain period of time. If they've done something egregious and actually harmful. Not just because they voted away or they made a motion you didn't like or voted against something you wanted, whatever the case is. But now I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about... Fiduciary duty, 10.3.1, duty of care. A director, now I'm, I, I typed this up, but I typed it exactly from the bylaws. A director must perform the duties of a director, that's kind of weird, including duties as a member of any committee of the board upon which the director may serve in good faith in a manner such the director believes to be in the best interest of the organization and with such care, including reasonable inquiry. As an ordinarily prudent person in a like position would use under similar circumstances. I want to go back to that that I emphasized. Including reasonable 
inquiry. So this is the question I have, even for you, Russell. I know you haven't been on the board all that long, but why was Scott Arnberg stonewalled when he asked for past financial documents? That is a reasonable inquiry. A board member chairing the finance committee should have unfettered access to all of the legacy financial documents. That's not up for debate. That's an end of discussion topic. Moving on. Next is 10.3.3 fiduciary duty, duty of obedience. Now I'm about to talk about something that was before Russell, so this has nothing to do with him directly. But the direction of the board has been going for several years now, and the problem Russell seems to be unaware of by his own admission. Remember, he said on the Bullets and Bourbon podcast, I don't know what all this protest stuff is about. All right, so here we go. I'm going to read a line that I uh, typed from directly from the bylaws. Directors must make sure that the organization is abiding by all applicable laws and regulations and doesn't engage in illegal or unauthorized activities. Dot, 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 dot. Because it keeps going. But I wasn't going to read the whole thing. That's the only part I needed to, to read. So let me ask you this. How does cameo shooting an education complex not fall under this bylaw? The board knew it was illegal to bring certain items necessary for a match to that range due to the current state laws in Colorado. Doesn't matter if the local law enforcement agency said they will turn a blind eye. It's illegal in that state until further notice. Now, hopefully, the Supreme Court will overturn it, and then we can go to Cameo, because nobody wants to go to Cameo any more than me. That place, everything I've heard about it is amazing. I think it would be a great place to go and, and shoot a match. However, it is the board's responsibility to ensure it is not putting its members at risk when holding a Nationals-level event. Again, this is not debatable. That's the end of the discussion. You cannot hold a match in a state which is going to restrict certain things and you know those certain things are included in certain divisions like open, like limited, like carry optics, like almost everything. So, no, don't don't stop making excuses. I don't want to hear any more excuses. You know what they say about excuses. They're like assholes. Everybody has them and they all stink. So just stop with the excuses. It was a poor decision on your part. Say, yep, we made a mistake. Hopefully the laws will be changed and we can go and shoot there. That That's it. You cannot hold a match somewhere and put your own members at risk. That's ridiculous. Now, at 2326, this is so now it's after they've removed Scott, a motion was made to approve a special election committee. Now, that special election committee was Russell Fortney, who was chairing it, Leighton, and Mel. Hmm. The same Leighton that removed Scott from the finance committee using an out-of-order motion. So the same guy that has been actively working to remove Scott or I'm sorry, he actively removed Scott from a committee. And now the board is appointing one of the folks to head up this special election and appoint someone to Scott's temporary replacement. There is no way that could be self-serving at all. Insert sarcasm here. And you'll see the connection when I discuss January's board meeting. Interestingly enough, the very next month, Donna happened to find, quote-unquote, happened to find broken time in Frank's membership status within three years of him taking office as Area 7 director. So there in January, now they're going to try to remove Frank, the same guy that's been voting no with some of their stuff. Hmm, another, another roadblock for the legacy board. Interesting. The one positive note that did come from the December meeting is Frank's motion at 2337. 
to make the area directors and president's expense reports available to the membership on an annual basis. Leighton seconded it, and it passed unanimously. Good on Leighton for seconding it, and good to everyone that voted yes. That's awesome. Now I want to see all of them for the last five years. Do I need to put that in writing? Because I'd like to see them. Now, this brings us to the January board meeting. This, so if December wasn't bad enough, January uh, hammered the nail into the coffin. Thank God, I've been calling for live streaming the, the meetings forever because I always felt that if you live stream it, there's there are no rumors. People will know what happens. Well, holy cow, did that backfire on the board. Um, and, and look, I'm going to say this because I haven't heard anybody else say this, so you're going to hear it here. But I talked to people at SHOT Show. I was there. That's when the board meeting occurred was that Monday night SHOT Show started Tuesday. And guess what people were talking about Tuesday at SHOT Show? You got it. How screwed up the board is and how jacked up the organization is because of the board. Not because of the organization itself, but the board. Specifically, the board. Specifically, certain people on the board. And I'm not talking Yi Min Lin and Ben Barry neither, nor Frank. I'll let you figure out the rest from there. I think that's the single greatest thing that has happened after the creation of IPSC and USPSA themselves was them live streaming because now we saw the true colors of the board members. We saw the managing director rolling her eyes, did we not? And also, and that was while another area director was talking. Hmm. And then they came out and tried to deny it. No, I'm sorry, there's video evidence of it. Stop trying to deny it. Just like stop trying to deny Cameo. Stop it. You're making things worse. And Russell, when everybody was confused as to what, how they were supposed to vote on a certain motion, which I believe at the time was either to, to I think it might have been a motion... Oh boy, it had to do with the bylaw and Frank. It was either a, e either voting Frank off the board or um, not following a bylaw, whatever it was. But everybody seemed to, several people, not everybody, but several people seemed to be confused by the end of the discussion as to what a yes vote meant and what a no vote meant. And Russell on video looks looks at Lee Min on, on the screen and says, what did you expect with that vote? So I was like, whoa, that was kind of rude. Um, so the first half of that meeting was the legacy board and Russell trying to remove Frank Rizzi, which they successfully did for two days. But that's an entirely separate conversation and why I don't think Russell is board material. Again, I'm not saying he's a bad person. I'm just saying I don't think he's board material. I really don't. Yes, there are rules that have to be followed. There's intent, and there's different levels of infractions. If you notice in the penal code, it isn't just murder. There's different levels of murder. Some of them, we realize that there's accidental murder, and they don't get the same punishment as somebody who planned someone's murder because they can get the death penalty. Now, that's an extreme example, obviously. But my point is that not all infractions are the same. And you have to weigh that. And you have to weigh the intent. That's why it's so hard to get a capital punishment um, verdict on a person. Because the, the weight of that is incredible. So you've got the evidence must be overwhelming. Anyway, here's the other interesting part. I believe, um, yeah, this was Monday still. So this was still part one of the two part January board meeting that was live streamed. After all the arguments and executive sessions, 
They might have set a record that night with the number of executive sessions they went into. There was a nominee that was given to the special election committee, which again is chaired by Russell Fortney, for Area 3. That information had been shared with all the board members prior to the meeting. As Russell started to speak, he sent out an email to the rest of the board changing the nominee. So there was no advance notice. Nobody knew before that board meeting started that they were not going with who they initially planned on. The name that was given them was from the section coordinators themselves in Area 3. They decided they were going to go against that. Now, if you listen to the Bullets and Bourbon podcast, he said they made that determination. They knew that the Friday before, that there was, in their words, a conflict because the person that was nominated was running for Area 3, and then all of a sudden, oh, they learned of another person who's running for Area 3, and they felt it would be an unfair advantage, thereby being like an election conflict. Well... I disagree wholeheartedly. And I say that because I think if you put someone in there, then the people in that area will know who they are. Like with Russell, nobody knew who Russell was other than uh, a range master, a match director at his local range, um, and an RO, you know. And he traveled around and did all this stuff. And people liked him. So it was a popularity contest. Now, had he been on the board for six months before the vote, would he still be the area director today? I believe the nominee was Luke Faust. If you put Luke in there, and the vote isn't for a couple of months, then the question becomes... Do people now know who Luke Faust is and how he's going to be as an area director? People may like it. People may not like it. You don't know. I don't think it's an unfair advantage. It's not like we're dealing with politics and you're getting money for your campaign because you're in office. That's not how this works. It's not the same. I think it's personally, I think it's an excuse to not let Luke on because Luke per. I'm sorry, publicly stated that dealing with Scott would be easier than dealing with him. Well, I can't imagine that at the time, Mel and Layton and them really wanted to deal with that. So what's the easiest thing to do? Oh, we learned of another guy who's going to run for Area 3 director, so we don't think we should nominate him. That's the easiest thing to do. But let's not gloss over the fact that he waited, literally waited until the very last second to send that email out. If you go back and watch, as he starts to talk, Ben Barry starts to smile and shake his head. I didn't say nod. Nod is up and down. Shake is left to right. He shook his head, and that was the moment that the email came through to the rest of the board that they were changing the nominee. How about that? How about that? Now, let's get to the Bullets and Bourbon podcast. Russell stated that he felt there would be an unfair advantage. We talked about all of that. Um, I disagree. I think Russell having, if he had been nominated to finish out Ted's term, uh, people would know who he was. And I don't, I don't know if he would... St- be the Area 8 director now. I mean, folks would have a better idea of who and what he is, and they would they'd be able to make a better decision when they went to vote. They may still want him, and that's okay. I, you know, it is what it is. But that's what that's that's how I'm looking at it. That's my viewpoint. I would rather know what it is I'm voting for. If I don't know what I'm voting for, I'm not voting for it. 2008 election, I liked neither presidential candidate. Dave didn't vote because it's voting for worse and worse. There is no win. Neither one of them is a win. They were both worthless. So, Russell said in that same podcast, he said he reads all the emails in response to folks within Area 8. 
Look, I get that he doesn't respond to people outside of Area 8. Okay. Um, There's still fellow members of USPSA, so I don't think there's a harm in responding to them. But if you are, like right now, I imagine he is getting a lot of emails. In that case, okay, limit it to the guy, the people in your area and just respond to that. Now, I posted my email publicly. Guess what I didn't get? I didn't get a reply. Maybe he read it. Maybe he didn't. I have no idea. I did get a reply from another area director, but not Russell. Russell hasn't reached out once to explain why he voted the way he did and try to set the record straight. I've never attacked him. That's what he said in the podcast. You know, some people attack you. I've never attacked him. I actually offered this platform for him to come on before he got elected and talk about we could talk about, like I do with everybody else, we talk about how you got into shooting. We talk about all of that other information first. Let's get to know the person. And then we can talk about why you want to run for Area 8 director. When, when you thought I didn't like you, I reached out to say that's not the case. I think it's actually quite the opposite, Russell. I think you don't like me. You're the one who won't talk to me. And I don't mean on the podcast. I mean just in general. You haven't reached out once. It is what it is. Doesn't hurt my feelings. Trust me. Now, on the podcast, you said two of the three votes were close calls. That tells me two of them were not clear cut. So what happened to the tie going to the base runner? What does that mean? If you don't follow baseball, that means giving the benefit of the doubt to the individual and not the organization. It's kind of like when you go into court and they're trying you for a crime they said you commit, but it's beyond a reasonable doubt. There's, a, there's doubt here. A close call is doubt. So why did you give the benefit of the doubt to the organization and not the individual? Look, there, is, there are plenty of witnesses that said, you men did the horseplay. There's plenty of individuals that said, Mel went off at a match. There are plenty of individuals who witnessed Leighton going off at a match. So you have evidence there showing what these individuals did. Same thing with Troy. Plenty of people saw it. This, you're saying there's doubt. Hmm. So why'd you vote the way you did? Now, my conclusion is going to be a little bit long. It's a few chapters here, but we're going we're gonna to finish this up. Now, in conclusion, I think there are some issues with DNROI and anger. Personally, I think Russell would be a great fit for that because he is more black and white. I don't think he's able to understand and differentiate that there's different levels of things we need to look at. As I understand it, I could be wrong. He hasn't come on my podcast and we haven't talked about this personally. As I understand it, he was a scientist or something like that who worked for the FDA or, or some government organization like that. Maybe he's so used to having control groups that he's like, oh, it has to be exactly this. It has to be exactly that. Maybe that's why he's so black and white. But if that's the case, what's up with this close call stuff? Now, I think he would make a great DNROI. I really do, because I think in that situation, it is more black and white. It is more cut and dry. Not exact, but it's closer. And I think he would be, and look, he's, uh, everything I've heard and seen, he definitely knows his way around the rules, stages, a match, the whole nine yards. He's as close to an expert as you're going to get. As, the lead, as I said, as, as the leader of the area, you need to use some discretion, especially when we're talking about dealing with individuals. Yes, you have to follow the bylaws. But you must weigh what's best for the organization and the members, not just what does the bylaw say. And you must also be public and be available. Another thing, sponsors and clubs are leaving the USPSA or running outlaw, hit factor, or PCL, PCSL matches. Phil Strader is the director of operations at Sig Sauer Academy. You know who he is. He's been the director of product management there. He was the president of the USPSA. He's been a national champion. Uh, Sig Sauer is the match sponsor for Carry Optics Nationals. 
He even sent a letter to the board putting them on notice, that includes you, that he's unhappy with the state of the organization. Stop saying you don't know what the protest is about. At best, that's disingenuous. You know what the protest is about. You have plenty of letters. People have told you. Leighton, Mel, and Troy have all acted unprofessionally at matches in the very recent past. Why is this being allowed? Yemen Lin can, cannot horseplay, but others can scream at people? Think about intent. As a matter of fact, I don't even think the discipline committee for Yemen Lin came back and said, remove his RO. I think that was a Troy thing. I'm pretty sure that's accurate. I know that was before you, but still, think about it. Intent. And let's think about hypocrisy. I am not a burn it down person. I don't want to see anything burned down. If matches are still running USPSA matches, I have no issue with that. I do believe in the protest and I do believe that something needs to change. The USPSA is awesome. Some of the folks that are running it, not quite as awesome. That's what I feel needs to change. Everyone must decide from the for themselves what they want and what they don't want. I want a board that I can trust to operate with the member's best interest in mind and can stop the financial bleeding. You asked them, Frank and Matt, Mank, what they wanted. Well, I'm telling you what I want. I want a board I can trust. And I want one that can stop the financial bleeding. Those two combined would delete the vast majority of the drama and make USPSA fun again. And I'll leave you with that. Have a great weekend. Until next time. Don't be a little bitch. Yeah.